Okay, perfect. Um, so my name's Azure. I work with QS in the Bay Area and Berkeley. So that's why I'm Skyping in today from the other side of the world. Um, but Justin wrote to me, he's been part of a participant led research project that we've been doing. Um, and I'm just here to give you guys a little bit of a flavor for what this project was, what we wanted to learn, and then what we've been learning so far. Um, so participant led research is still sort of a new thing in general, as far as <laughs> um, and what we basically did was take a group of people in QS who were interested in learning something um, about their cholesterol and triglycerides. Uh, and we had them do sort of a coordinated research project together where they were both doing their own self experiments and were part of one big group experiment. So this is an outline of, of what we did. Everyone in the group got um, a cholesterol and uh, triglyceride test kit in the mail. Um, because we were all over the world, uh, we mostly coordinated online via webinars and um, sort of chat Google Hangouts and things. Um, there were actually a lot of controls and sort of standardizations that we put in the group to make sure that the devices were working the same for everyone. Because instead of being in a clinic like you would usually be for these kind of tests, everyone was just in their homes or, or traveling around. Um, so we did some validations together. And then everyone in the group um, collected at least four samples within a single day. Um, our big group question was sort of to say, what new can we learn um, about our physiology by measuring our cholesterol and triglycerides much more frequently than normal? So whereas you'd normally measure them maybe once a year at the doctor's office, uh, we were measuring them up to once an hour. Um, and so after that, uh, each person in the group did a personal experiment surrounding a question that they were interested in um, over six to eight, eight weeks. Um, everybody sort of had control over their own data or could share it as they liked um, and then could do their own analyses or reach out to myself or others in the group to do those analyses. Um, and this is sort of where we are right now. We're still analyzing data and then um, starting to share what we learn and are going to be sharing more in the springtime. Can you all still hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Perfect. Okay. So a little bit about the test system that we used. It was called the Cardio Check Plus. Um, this is it right here in the middle. It looks like a really clunky old fashioned Game Boy. Um, and it was a finger prick uh, blood test strip type device. So um, uses reflectance spectrometry um, to calculate cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Uh, and I'd say the most remarkable thing about it is that it actually takes quite a bit of blood. So um, if you've ever done an at-home glucose test, this takes about twice as much blood um, as one of those. So the people in the group were sort of very good sports to be willing to do so many of these tests on themselves. Um, and it's one of only a couple devices so far that in the U.S. are FDA approved for at-home use. So that's why we selected it. Gesundheit. And a little bit more on our group. There were um, 25 of us in nine countries on three different continents. Um, our group was about uh, a third women and two thirds men. And as is typical for QS community, um, our backgrounds were mostly in research or data and analysis, engineering. We had a few entrepreneurs and also a few people who were just um, very long time self trackers. And this group got together um, sort of early to mid uh, 2017 and was finalized around the, um, the QS17 conference in Amsterdam. Everybody got together and uh, talked about what they were interested in learning. And so questions that people tried to address varied from everything from just wondering how accurate and precise data could be from one of these devices um, to this idea of uh, if you've heard of circadian rhythms, um, do you see structured daily change that is predictable within cholesterol and triglycerides? Um, some other people in the group were sort of peristatin, trying to decide whether or not they needed to go on statins to lower their cholesterol. And 
wanted to see if some sort of behavior change in diet, exercise, or stress level um, could exert an effect on their cholesterol and triglycerides fairly quickly. And then uh, because everybody was doing a personal experiment, we had 25 different questions, so I won't go into them all, but, um, but that's sort of the general gist of them. And so first, uh, how good is the data that we were able to collect? So we all learned um, a lot from this project. And one of the first things that we learned was that the allowable error for a clinical lipid panel is actually 13%, um, which was quite a bit. And I was surprised when I saw that. Um, and so a couple of things we did when we first got our devices were um, a large handful of us uh, took our devices to a clinic and did a side-by-side -side where we had our blood drawn by a professional and then did one of these tests at the same time. Um, and so what you're looking at in these bar charts are QS data, so data we collected in blue, and then red is PTS or the, um, the manufacturer of the device. When they did their internal validation, what did they report? Um, and so for total cholesterol, our error was around 10% compared to the clinic. Uh, the manufacturer was a bit higher. Um, for HDL, it was around 10% uh, for both of us. Um, and for triglycerides, we actually had um, higher error around 25% um, um, when compared to the clinic. So we saw sort of a 10 to 25% difference from our lipid panels, um, which is within expectation when both um, means of measurement have some uncertainty in them. Um, but it's still quite a bit. Um, and so what finally gave me confidence in this project was that um, the precision of the test uh, is about 96%. So if you do uh, two tests side by side, both on this one device, um, those numbers will be within each other um, with only about 4% in precision. So big takeaway from this um, is that the machinery was quite precise, despite being a little inaccurate. Um, so we could, could successfully compare measures um, taken with the same device over time to each other to understand the raw amount of change um, we saw. So there's that. And then I just want to take you through a little um, sort of smattering of a couple results that we've had so far. Um, so this is a plot just to show you an example of someone taking um, lipid measurements on themselves every hour from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. Um, and this is their cholesterol on the y-axis. And what they saw was that there was actually, you could do a sign fit of a 24-hour rhythm to this that fit quite well, um, suggesting that... Uh, Cholesterol, at least, seems to show a circadian rhythm where it's a little bit lower in the morning and gets higher um, and then begins to taper off at the end of the day. And the other thing that was interesting here was that um, each of these sort of smaller peaks that you see corresponded to after the person ate a meal. So it was low and then breakfast it raised up and then lunch it raised up and then um, a snack and dinner brought it higher and higher. Um, so this showed us that we were seeing pretty fast um, time scale regulation, both at the time scale of when the person was eating and superimposed on top of that sort of a larger uh, sine wave across the day. So here's an illustration of that, just sort of in cartoon form. Uh, if you think about you get hungry and then you eat something, your triglycerides will raise. You get hungry again, they'll raise up even further. Um, and so you get these little wiggles, but you also sort of get this daily arch there on its own. And this was just one person's example, but, um, but we saw sort of similar things to this across almost everyone in the group. Um, and by looking through all of these, this is data that we're still working with um, now, but on the whole, we've seen that uh, cholesterol and HDL to a smaller extent, definitely triglycerides, seem to show this, um, this larger every day night, they go up and down, and then these smaller wiggles superimposed on top of them, um, which hasn't really been reported extensively on in the scientific literature yet. So we're excited about um, having learned about this a little. 
Uh, this is another example of an experiment that someone did. So you're looking at still cholesterol, um, same sort of time scale on the x-axis from about 5 a.m. in the morning till a little after midnight, um, 110 milligrams per deciliter, 200 on the y-axis. And so this person went through and took a measurement every hour of the day, first in blue, um, before any sort of dietary change. So just sort of normal American diet. Um, and then in yellow, after having been on a vegan diet for only two weeks. Um, and we thought this was really interesting because first she showed the same sort of shape of change throughout the day uh, as before her dietary change. So this little hill that you see with smaller bumps from when they were eating. But there was about a 20 milligram per deciliter drop at most points throughout that day, sometimes much more. Uh, and this sort of illustrated that at least for this person, um, they were able to get their lipids down pretty quickly after only a couple weeks of dietary sure. change. Oh, yeah, sir. And then this was uh, another type of experiment that someone did surrounding exercise. So this was uh, lipids measured about once a day uh, over the course of a month, even though you can't see this x-axis right here. Um, and you're looking at in blue there, total cholesterol, and then down here at the bottom, sort of all mushed together, their triglycerides, LDL, and HDL, um, which sort of all gradually tapered down um, as this person was doing more and more running leading up to a marathon. Um, and this finding was interesting because uh, individually, this uh, was opposite to um, what they had seen reported in the literature for long distance running. Um, so it appears that there's at least some uh, between individual variability there. Um, and speaking of just variability in general, um, I think this is one of the most important takeaways that we've gotten from the project. Uh, what you're looking at here, like in the first couple of plots is just a, a single day um, in clock time. So 6 a.m. to about 11 p.m. on the x-axis um, cholesterol level on the y-axis, but this is, um, a person took, I believe it was like 50 measurements over the course of maybe a, a month and a half. Um, and most of them were fasted in the morning measurements. And so what I have done here is just plot all of those irrespective of the actual day they were taken, but just based on the time of day they were taken. Um, and my thought had at first been that uh, they would all be pretty low in the morning and then increase throughout the day. Um, but what we actually see is was way more surprising and I think interesting. And that's there's a ton of wiggle um, just in the morning. And all of these points are actually when this person was in a fasted state. Um, so we thought and thought about this and thought, is this machine error? No, the, the measurements compared to themselves are actually quite precise. Uh, what could this be from? And we're still thinking about it. But um, for perspective, the entire day variability was 100 milligrams per deciliter. And just the morning fasted between the hours of about 8.30 and 11 were 75 milligrams per deciliter. Um, basically meaning that if this person went to the doctor, they could have been um, told that they had anything from like moderately high cholesterol or pretty healthy or very high cholesterol that needed, um, needed treatment. Um, so this has really made us, made us think a lot about what we're learning and what it might mean. Uh, so a couple take homes, uh, I don't want to run over, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but um, Things that we learned so far that you might have predicted was that uh, all of our participants show some level of sinusoidal daily change and some meal response in their lipids when you measure them very frequently. Um, we've learned that dietary change uh, in the people who tried it in our group can have a pretty quick effect on fasting and across a day cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, and I didn't show you all this data, but we basically saw that in some people, exercise decreased total cholesterol in the long term. Um, but if people measured it in the short term, say right after they had gone for a run or something, uh, it would actually just be up a little bit, wouldn't, wouldn't decrease that quickly. Um, and then things you might not have predicted was that cholesterol varied 30 milligrams to about 100 milligrams across a single day. 
and sometimes across risk categories. And then at least in some individuals, like the one that I just showed you, um, they could vary up to 75 milligrams per deciliter across risk categories just on different mornings in the fasted state. And so this is really our biggest takeaway is that um, based on the data that we've collected, it seems like a single fasted measurement at the doctor's office might not be enough to um, assess whether an individual's cholesterol and triglycerides are normal or high um, or really give them a complete picture. So I'll leave you with this cartoon of a person wondering, based on a single elevated measure at the doctor's office, is this real or is maybe this an effect of time? Um, and so I'll, I'll give this back to Justin and um, see if I can see you guys for a second. But if you have questions or are interested in participating even, um, feel free to write to me or check out our uh, Vimeo account. It has a couple of animations about the project or our website, qscvd.quantifiedself.com. Um, talks a bit about an event that we're hosting in San Diego in the springtime uh, surrounding this project. So I'm going to take this off my screen and Dustin, I'll pop back in and say hello. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Hello?